So, if you're not sure where it is, it's uh, a bit more than three quarters of the way through the Bible. Uh, if you turn to the three quarters of the way through the Bible, you probably hit Matthew, and then after that is Mark, and after that is Luke, or you can go to the table of contents in your Bible and find it in the New Testament, the second group of books of the 66 books in the Bible. And so we're going to read in the Gospel of Luke, which is one of the four biographies of Jesus that we have in the Bible. We're going to read a portion of Luke chapter 15. And this is teaching that Jesus was doing. And uh, Luke 15, we're going to read verse, uh, verses 11 through 32. So from verse 11 uh, to the end of the chapter. So big number 15, little number 11 is where we're going to start as we read and as Jesus tells this uh, story, this illustration that is commonly called in the Bible a parable. Luke 15, 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. It's the end of our reading here today. One of the things that I've been thinking about lately is problems. And I don't mean just any sort of problems, I mean all the problems. I've been thinking about all of the problems. I mean all of the problems. I don't mean just all the problems with me or the problems with us or the problems with our country. I'm talking all the problems. And I've been thinking about that because there are Christians who say that the Christian message, what, what we call the gospel, the good news, is actually the answer to all of the world's problems. Now, when you think about that, that's a, that's a pretty bold statement. That's a pretty big statement, that the, that the Christian message is the answer to all problems that all people have in life. So, I tried to think of all the problems that people have. I actually tried to like write them down, like every single problem 
that people could have, okay? And it took a while. I, I got a couple of, of, of other sources to help in, in my catalog of problems. And by last count, I believe I came up with 84 problems. Now, these 84 problems actually come in pairs. Um, and maybe I'll talk about that at, at some future point in more detail. Um, so it's actually 42 pairs of problems that come to 84 problems. And, and, and as far as I can tell, and maybe I'm going to come up with more, but as far as I can tell, all the problems we have are on that list somewhere. Now, a lot of the problems that we have and that we deal with are actually complex. For example, let's say that um, you're terminated from your job. You've been working a job, and you are, you are called in and, and told that um, at the end of the day, you no longer have a job. Now, that might seem like one problem, but it's actually a bunch of different problems. It's a complex problem. It's a bunch of different problems that are all tied into that one problem. It doesn't just hurt you in one way. It hurts you in multiple ways. It doesn't just make you afraid about one thing or angry about one thing or fearful or sad about one thing, but in multiple ways it strikes you, okay? But, but my list that I came up with was to try to get down to the sort of the elementary problems that all of our problems that we face that are more complicated are, are made up of all these more simple basic problems. And it was a lot of problems. So I looked at this list of problems and I tried to see, okay, so how is the Christian message the answer to all these problems? And as I did some, some reading and some learning and some thinking and what other, some other people have talked about with respect to this, I came to learn and came to, to recognize and find that with all the problems that we human beings encounter in our lives and, and all the problems that the people that we know and love encounter that we want to help them out with, that we care about for them, that there's basically only three ways that people approach, to, approaches that people take to solve their problems. I mean, you can get more complicated than it. You can take each of those three things and you can multiply it out to all these different variations. But it basically comes down to three things. And those three things are the three things that you can follow. Three, things that, three paths that you follow to solve your problems. You can follow the rules or you can follow your heart or you can follow Christ. And I would, I would propose to you today that no matter who you are, no matter how old you are or young you are, no matter what your life experience has been, no matter what your religion is even, that, that, that there are three basic ways that people take, paths that people take, to solve their problems, and those are those three. You can follow the rules, you can follow your heart, or you can follow Christ. Now, I like this parable of the lost son, also known as the parable of the prodigal son. Prodigal is a very, very old-fashioned English word that means spendthrift. You know, you just like, you know, money just flow. I mean, it flows in you and flows out of you. You'll, you know, you, you'll spend lavishly on anything. You'll give generously to anything. That's what prodigal means. And it's referring to this younger son. But if, if you look carefully in this text, you see that it's not the parable about just one son. It's not the parable of a single lost son. It is a parable of the lost sons. There are two sons. Both of them are lost. One of them figures it out. The other one has trouble seeing it. But these two different lost sons, is there a problem? These two different lost sons represent two of those approaches that people take to solving their problems. So the first one that we're going to look at is actually the second one I mentioned, which is to follow your heart. And following your heart is represented by the younger son. Now, I'm actually kind of curious. I, I haven't done this in preparation for this message, but I, I would like to see if there's some way that I can Google the term follow your heart, and try to find the first time that it was used in the English language. I'm, I'm thinking, like, 
you know, not more than 50 years ago, maybe 25 years ago. It's possible that Disney has something to do with it. I'm not 100% sure. But, um, you know, maybe Oprah Winfrey, I'm not 100% sure. But, but follow your heart, um, even though that phrase is, is more of recent vintage, is an old, old concept, okay? And, and the follow your heart approach is basically a, a, an approach that looks at the universe and sees the universe as, as something that, um, it, in many cases, is basically kind and, and is basically um, encouraging and and that whatever your natural impulse is, whatever you know, whatever you naturally have have built into you that you are inclined to do, desire, pursue is a good thing. And, and so the key to life and the key to solving your problems is to identify what those desires are and to pursue those desires, and to and to and to identify your perspective on what is true and what is false, what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil, and, and to follow that and, and to use the mind that you have and the heart that you have and to chart your own path, to go your own course, to pioneer, to blaze your own trail to solve your problems and to find happiness. Okay? And, and that's the approach that the younger son takes, right? The younger son it, his, he's looking at life from the perspective of, I don't have what I want right now. I have cravings that are not satisfied. And those cravings will be satisfied by my father's money. So I would really like it if he were dead. Because if he were dead, then I could have my share of the estate and I could follow my heart. I could make my own path. I could follow my own way. I could do what I want and I could be happy. And I could solve the problems of my cravings that are not being satisfied. So he goes to his father and actually says, you know, would you just divide the estate right now and give me what's mine so I can get on with my life? And the father, rather than being offended by this, rather than being insulted by this, rather than saying, no, absolutely not, you ingrate, says, okay, I'll do it. And he divides his estate and he gives the younger son the one-third of the estate that would be due to him. And he takes it, and he, li he liquidates it, turns it into cash, and he goes and he does his own thing. And it says that he squandered it, he squandered his wealth in wild living. And he went his own way, and he did his own thing. But the problem with that approach, the problem with the follow-your-own-heart approach, is that no matter how far you follow your heart, it never leads you to where you ultimately want to go. It never leads you to where you ultimately want to go. You never get to this point that, that your heart has finally gotten to a position where I made it, I'm satisfied, I'm done. Because sometimes what happens is that, um, is that people, as they, as they go for it, um, they get, you know, a few people kind of get lucky and they sort of like, um, you know, reach the end of the rainbow and, and there's the pot of gold there. And when they, when they get the thing that they thought they wanted, they find that they don't want it nearly as much as they thought they did. And there's still a craving within that's not satisfied. Now, I think that most people don't have that experience. I mean, there are certain highly successful people, you know, very famous or very wealthy people, very ambitious people, who, who actually manage to get that thing. They reach the top of the greasy pole, you know. They find the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You know, they, they, they reach the Emerald City. You know, all their wildest dreams are going to come true. They've made it, and they're unhappy. But I think that most people who take this approach um, don't have that strength. They don't have that talent. They don't have that wealth. They don't have that success. And so they're still caught trying to crack the code of how am I going to get the thing that I want and how am I going to be satisfied and how am I going to deal with these problems in my life? So, I mean, this can manifest itself in a variety of ways. This can manifest itself in the, in the, in, in the approach of if I just, you know, get that promotion, then I'll make that much more money, then I'll be able to buy this much more stuff or I'll be able to do this other thing and then it'll be fine. Or... You know, if, if I can just get out of this marriage in which I feel trapped, 
then I can find true romance and true happiness, and then I'm going to be happy. I mean, there's, there's 101 different ways that people live this out, like the younger son. They want to follow their own way. They want to chart their own path. In some ways, it, it's, it, and sometimes it's not something that's crass. It's not something materialistic. It's, it, it's some sort of in, inner search or some intellectual search or whatever. But a lot of people, they never get to the point that they find the pot of gold that doesn't satisfy. They just never get to the pot of gold at all. It's like, you know, the old song, the bear went over the mountain, right? The bear went over the mountain to see what he could see. And what's the second verse? He saw another mountain, right? I mean, there's just, there's just more mountains all the way along. And so people then get, you know, fall into despair. They get frustrated. They get desperate that, that the choices that they make as they try to follow their heart, as they try to do what seems to make sense to them, never seems to end up where they want it to go and where they want it to be. And so some people, when they reach that point, just continue on forever and ever and ever, keep going to that next mountain, that next mountain, that next mountain. Other people stop at the top of the mountain, look at the next mountain and conclude, you know what, maybe there is no path. Maybe there is no other side of the mountain. Maybe there is no way forward. And maybe the universe isn't actually all that concerned about my satisfaction after all. Maybe the universe doesn't really care about whether I follow my heart and follow my dreams and achieve what I th think I'm going to achieve. And so they try to find some way to make their peace with the status quo. They find a, try to find some way to make their peace with their unhappiness, with their dissatisfaction, with where it is. Maybe try to rationalize that, that maybe the way things are right now, maybe the hurts that I have, maybe the cravings that I have that are unsatisfied, maybe this is actually good in some way. Maybe this is actually right in some way. If I can just sort of detach and, and free my mind from this lower plane of living, maybe I'll see that actually all of this is, is holy. Maybe all of this is good. Maybe all of this is right. That's one approach that people take. And that's sort of where the younger son ends up when he's with the pigs. You know, he's chased. He's gone what he's, what, the way he's wanted to go. He's done what he's wanted to do. And he's, where has he ended up? He's ended up starving, feeding pigs. Now, the younger son comes to a different conclusion. He comes to a conclusion, maybe following my heart was not the way. But a lot of people don't come to that conclusion. And they continue to go that way or rationalize it to themselves for the rest of their lives. So that's one approach that people can take, to follow their heart. But another approach that people can take is to follow the rules. To follow the rules. And following the rules is represented by the older son. Now, the approach to following the rules is a, is a philosophy that assumes or believes that the universe is basically fair to all. And if I know what the rules are for the world, if I know what the rules are for the universe and the rules of right and wrong, and I follow those rules, whether we're talking like transcendent rules of moral right and wrong, or whether we're talking the policies in the employee manual of my company, or the laws of the land, or whatever, if I follow the guidelines, if I do the instructions, if I do what I'm told to do and I don't do what I'm told not to do, then things will work out then things will be okay. Then my hurts will be healed. Then my cravings will be satisfied. A and so this is represented by the older son. The older son, while the younger son has been going out his merry way, I mean, the older son could have looked at that and said, well, geez, if he would do it for him, he'd do it for me too, right? And I'm the older son, so I'm going to get twice as much, you know, according to the customs of the day. And so then I can party twice as long or twice as, you know, hard or whatever. But instead, what the older son does is he goes out into the field. This is a rich man, the father. He's got this big estate. He's got all these servants. But the son is a hard worker. He's a hardworking guy. And so he's going to go out into that field and he's going to work hard. He's going to be the last one in at the end of the day. When all the other servants come in, he's still going to be out there working hard. That's his approach. He's going to follow the rules. He's going to keep his nose clean. And then eventually, someday, he'll get the thing that he's been hoping for, which happens to be the same thing that the younger son is hoping for, of satisfaction. But he's taking a different approach, the follow the rules approach. The problem with the, father, the follow the rules approach is that many people who try hard to follow the rules, in fact, this generally only happens for the people who try to follow the rules the hardest, discover that they can't. Discover that they're not adequate to do it. Now, now again, 
sometimes people find out that I've been, you know, I've been breaking the rules. Sometimes some of your follow your heart type people, when they end up, you know, in the pigsty, that then they think, oh man, maybe the follow the rules people were right all along, and I have really broken the rules, right? So some people go that route, but most people who who find out that they're unable to follow the rules have to try really, really hard to do it before they figure it out. I mean, most people are just kind of sort of skating by in that approach can continue to believe I'm actually following the rules. But some people, when they really drive hard after it, find every rule I keep, there's two that I seem to break. You know, or I can, I can keep the rules well all the time, but then I find this animal within this enemy within that just jumps out and breaks out and says that thing or thinks that thing or does that thing that, that makes me feel guilty, that hurts other people, that embarrasses myself, and doggone it, I just cannot get this thing right. And so then they fall into despair because they believe the only way I can solve my problems is by following the rules. If I do good, then good will come to me, and I can't do good. But other people go along that way and they continue to convince themselves and to believe that they are doing that well, generally by comparing themselves to other people. You know, I'm following the rules, they're not following the rules, but I'm following the rules. This is the I'm a good person approach to life, right? I'm a good person. Hey, I'm a good person. You know, compare me to the younger brother over here, right? Younger brother, look at what he's doing. But for me, the older brother, I'm out in the field working hard, right? Putting in, a, putting in a solid day's work, okay? And so that way I must be good. Do I mess up? Sure, I mess up from time to time, but it's unintentional. I don't really mean it. And you know, if there's a God out there, and, and most of your rule-following people, by the way, believe that there's a God out there and believe that God is the source of the rules, God knows that my intentions are good. And, and God will overlook the things that I've done that are wrong and credit for me the things that I've done that are right. That's what God will do, because God is a pretty good guy like I am, and that's what I would do for somebody else, right? So making God in, in one's own image. So, so, so the problem is that, that for a person who believes that following the rules is the way to solve your problems, and then they actually think that they have followed the rules, is that when their problems don't get solved, they get upset about it. They get mad about it. It's like... What the heck, right? I mean, like, I'm getting cheated down here, right? You know, I've been following the rules. I've been keeping my nose clean. Why do I still have these problems in my life? Why do I have a, a, a bank book that looks like this? Why do I have kids who are acting like that? Why do I have um, a boss that's treating me this way, right? What, you know, why are all these things happening to me if I'm doing the right thing and if I'm trying really hard? And where people can end up is into this, this bitter conclusion, you know what, life's not fair. I thought life was fair, life's not fair. Life's hard, life stinks, get over it, right? In this sour, sort of angry place at why it hasn't worked out. And that's where the older son ends up, right? I mean, there's a party going on in his house. This dude's out in the field, right? He's out in the field. And when he finds out that there's a party going on for the younger son, he is incensed. He's so angry. He's so livid that he says he's not going to go in, which is, which is a huge insult to his father, especially in the, I mean, it would be in our day itself, right? No, I'm not going. But even more so in that day in which, um, you know, respect for elders, respect for parents was such a major cultural value, Okay. And the father, in his, in his mercy and his compassion, actually goes out to the son and says, Son, what's the deal? I mean, we're having a party. Why aren't you joining us? And what does the older son say? He says, Now you listen here, pops. Right? Well, he doesn't literally say that, but that's basically what he says, okay? Um, and uh, it, I, I should probably insert this now. If you've seen the Pixar movie Inside Out, which I, which I enormously enjoy. It touches me very, very deeply. Well, you know, we recorded it at our house. It was on TV. And so the kids have been watching it, watching it a lot lately. And these little, tiny little emotion beings live inside the head of this girl. And 
The, uh, and the one representing anger is this red dude who's got flames that come out of his head when he gets mad. He's hilarious. He's the best part of the whole thing. And, you know, when, when the girl's father is, 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 you know, getting on her case, then he, like, you know, grabs the levers in the console and puts them all the way up to 11 and flames come out of his head. And, you know, she, you know, smarts off at him and stuff. And that's, that's what the older son is doing right here. He's been stuffing it down for years. For years, he's been stuffing it down, and he's been holding his tongue. He's been biting his tongue because he's a rule follower, and he knows it's wrong to offend, to, to dishonor your parents. But now, finally, he just can't take it anymore, and he blows his stack, okay? And, and he says to the father, he says, look, it's verse 29, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, right? Following the rules. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. Now, maybe you wouldn't want a young goat to celebrate with your friends. You're kind of wondering, what are we going to do with a goat, right? But, okay, so back in those days, they didn't go to the grocery store, right? I mean, if you're out in the farm, right, you actually have the animal, you slaughter the animal, you skin the animal, you know, you butcher the animal, and then you barbecue, right? So that's what he's saying. Like, you wouldn't even give me, like, you know, a pack of hamburgers or a rack of ribs for me to celebrate with my friends. That's, that's what he's saying here, Okay. You wouldn't even give me that to celebrate with who? With my friends. With my friends. With my people. My way. With what I wanted. The father's reply to him is, Son, look, you've been with me all this time and everything I have is yours. What do you mean, me give you a young goat? It's your goat, right? All the stuff that's left. I gave your brother his. All of it is yours. And you know what? If you wanted to have a goat, you could just take that goat. And we could have it together. And, and maybe I could come to your party with your friends, right? But this guy is so bent, he is so focused on doing things his own way and getting what he wants that he can't see it. It's this tragic sort of thing. And he ends in this bitter, angry place, this bitter, angry guy. So those are two approaches, right? You can, you can follow the rules or you can follow your heart. But there's a third approach to solving your problems, and that's following Christ. And following Christ, when it's done deeply, and when it's done fully in all areas of your life, is truly the solution to all of your problems. Now, it may not be the solution to all of your problems in the next five minutes. Some of these problems are not going to get fully and finally solved until Jesus Christ himself returns. Or if we die in the meantime, then we have a very comfortable waiting area called heaven or paradise while we're waiting for then the final solution to come when Jesus returns. And when we rise in new bodies like the body he rose in on the third day after he was killed on the Friday before. So the, the, the gospel method, the third approach basically says this. The God who made the universe is actually more fair than I would have thought. And he's also more kind than I would have ever believed. He's actually more fair than the rule keeper assumes. And he's actually more kind than the way follower, than the heart follower could possibly imagine. Because what I find when I go down the Jesus road is that my rule-following solution is actually my problem. It's actually part of my problem because my objective in following the rules, just like with this older son, is to follow the rules to do the right thing, to get something for me, for my way, for my agenda, for my desires, which is actually way stinkier than any of the rule breaking that I could have done. Because as God is looking at me and my, my own desire to get what is mine, it doesn't matter what good things I do that I think are going to reach that destination. The destination itself is selfish and proud and ungrateful to God, and it stinks. So my problem isn't just my rule breaking, which is plenty bad because I'm breaking rules. My problem is my motives for my rule keeping. My rule keeping is even more obnoxious than my rule breaking. And that is my problem. But what did God do? 
He sent his son, the eternal son of God, who became a man, Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, the chosen one, who actually did perfectly keep the rules, who actually never broke the rules, who actually did follow the rules completely, 100% perfectly, but died on a cross that he didn't deserve to die for both my offensive rule-breaking and for my offensive rule-keeping. That is the Jesus way. But you know what? The Jesus way also says something else. The following Christ way says something also to the follow-your-heart person. And to illustrate that, I, I want to show you what the Apostle Paul said in, in, in his letter to the Galatians. Um, looks like I'm not going to show you, but I'm going to read it to you. The Apostle Paul said, we know that a person is not justified, that is, is not um, given the verdict of not guilty by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. That's what I was just talking to you about. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. No one will make it. But then he said something else. This is in Galatians 2.20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, what does that mean? What is that saying? It would be easy to say, that because the follow the rules approach to solving your problems is a dead end, that therefore, trusting in Jesus for, for forgiveness of that and for the gift of, of perfection and eternal life means that now I can just follow my heart. Now I can just live my own way and there's no negative consequences for this. But that's not what Paul says. What Paul says is that if I'm really going to follow the Jesus road, if I'm really going to follow Christ, that means I am giving up my heart. That means I'm surrendering my heart. That means I'm giving up my way. I'm surrendering my way. I don't, I don't have a heart anymore of my own. I don't have a way anymore of my own. I don't have an agenda anymore of my own. In fact, what's happening now is that Christ lives. He rose from the dead to be my way. He rose from the dead to be my path. He rose from the dead to be my life. And so now, if he lives in me, I'm no longer living my life, Paul says, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I've turned over the reins. I've, I've surrendered all the assets. I've signed over the deed. It belongs to him, and now he is living in me. Now, it's his direction by his spirit in my heart and mind that's directing to me the path that I'm supposed to walk. I can't just walk any path. I can't just walk any way. I'm walking the Jesus way because I'm not even walking it anymore. He's walking it in and through my body and mind and heart and soul. And so when that happens... Christ replaces my hurts by giving me God's kingdom. He replaces the problems of my hurts by giving me title, giving me an inheritance in perfection in the future. And he gives me little tastes of it now, healings now, transformation in heart and in motive and in desire now. These things happen now in a taste of the fullness that is coming and he's satisfying my cravings now, those cravings that I can't satisfy by giving me his own life, which is all satisfying joy. I only get little tastes. I only get little morsels. It's like an appetizer, but it's enough to tell me that the feast is coming. And if I continue to have faith, if I continue to believe this is the right road, if I don't get into this, if I do right things, then everything will work out for me approach. Or if I don't do this, if I follow my heart, everything will work out for me approach. But if I say Jesus is now my way, my truth, and my life, then yes, it will work out for me. He is the solution to my problems and to yours. Now, we all have a tendency to drift toward one of the false approaches or the other. Temperamentally, 
or by how we're raised or whatever, or how we rebelled against how we were raised, we tend to drift in more of a follow the rules direction by temperament or more in a follow your heart direction by temperament and philosophy. Sometimes people try to blend the two together. I recently read a book by a late Jewish rabbi who had spent a lot of time dabbling in Buddhism, and he managed to find a way to be both uh, follow the rules and things will work out and follow your own heart and things will work out kind of in a sort of sandwich or amalgamation in one, right? But, but um, what I'm asking you today, what I want you to think about is, where are you tempted? I bet for the Christians in this room that there's little that I've said today that is truly new. Maybe some of it has a new way of thinking, but I doubt there's little that I've said that's new, new, like you've never heard it before, but maybe your next step or your next insight is to turn inward and to say, what are the areas in my life where I have problems that I'm trying to solve? And in my solving of those problems, do I drift towards a, if I follow the rules, things will be okay mindset? And if things aren't okay, then I'm mad at somebody because I'm being cheated? Or the follow your heart and things will be okay mindset, and when things still aren't okay, now I fall into despair because I don't know the way to go, right? Which, which, which way do you tend to turn? And to take that before God and say, Lord, I want to believe your gospel more deeply than ever before. Or maybe I want to believe your gospel for the first time and believe that the Jesus way is the way, that following Christ is the way for the solution. This is something to meditate on during this last song. Kelly's going to play a song for us. And it's at a time I want you to be in prayer.